Anyone that follows Hurricanes would quickly acknowledge the fact that 1995 marked the beginning of the current era of extreme tropical cyclone activity in the Atlantic Basin. Climate change is usually mentioned these days, but the Atlantic Multidecadal Oscillation, or AMO, plays the dominant role in this period of extreme hurricanes and records broken, in addition to long periods of hurricane favorable, neutral, or La Nina patterns out in the equatorial Pacific Ocean. This and other factors that are currently being studied have led to a very interesting period for hurricane geeks. From 1995 onwards, we've seen 8 out of the 10 most active Atlantic hurricane seasons on record by number of named storms, including the first, second, and third most active seasons on record since 1851. The relative inactivity of the 1970s and most of the 80s was done away with in 1995. With 19 named storms, it is today the fifth most active hurricane season on record, tied with 1887, 2010, 2011, and 2012. But at the time, it ranked as the second most active, just behind the epic 1933 hurricane season. Out of the 19 named storms of 1995, 11 became hurricanes, which is still more than the tropical storms that you would have seen in an average season in the 70s or 80s. Five of those 11 hurricanes reached out category 3 or 4 intensity, which was above average as well. That said, 1995 was a historical hurricane season with lots of destruction experienced from Antigua through the Leeward Islands, Virgin Islands, and to Puerto Rico with Hurricanes Luis and Marilyn, the Yucatan Peninsula of Mexico with Hurricane Roxanne, and the U.S. Gulf Coast with the flattening storm surge of Hurricane Opal. Back in 95, I was just 10 years old and already following storm information over the TV and newspapers. In fact, many of the newspaper clips shown in this video were collected by myself back in those days. I was living in Puerto Rico, more specifically in the eastern town of Gurabo, from where I followed the craziness of 1995. Three storms threatened or hit our island that year. First was Tropical Storm Iris, during the late days of August. I should take a step back and begin with the train of storms that occurred during this period and began with Hurricane Humberto, followed by Iris, Karen, and Luis. You'd expect to see the J storm embedded in this train, but Jerry randomly formed near Florida while the HIKL storms were cooking east of the Antilles in the so-called main development region between the Caribbean and Africa. Back to Iris, it became an 85 mile per hour hurricane and weakened to a tropical storm before reaching St. Lucia in the Windward Islands on the night of August 25, with 60 mile per hour sustained winds. Meanwhile, Iris began turning almost due north while directly impacting Martinique, Dominica, Guadalupe, Montserrat, Antigua, and Barbuda during the 26th and 27th of August, with sustained winds ranging from between 45 and 65 miles per hour. I can recall that Iris's erratic northward turn was so uncertain due to its circulation interacting with nearby Hurricane Humberto that Puerto Rico was on alert for a potential tropical storm or even a hurricane hit. We never got a tropical storm watch or warning, but the U.S. Virgin Islands did, and it's usually Puerto Rico who comes next, so there was the expectation that it would happen. Eventually, Iris shied away from us, but became the first storm of concern that season, and it was the prelude for bigger threats to come. As I mentioned, the storm train, or parade of storms, as it has become known, became the hallmark of the very active 1995 hurricane season. 
it initiated the series of tropical cyclone threats that truly got me hurricane crazy. With Iris out of the way and Humberto and Karen recurving far from the islands, it was time to look further east. And there came Luis. Hurricane Luis started as most classic Cabo Verde hurricanes, developing from a juicy tropical wave that emerged off West Africa and encountered the right environmental conditions to develop into the full-fledged monster that it became. Luis became a tropical depression on August 28, a tropical storm six hours later, and a hurricane on August 31st, while still closer to Africa than the Antilles. As opposed to Iris, Humberto and Karen, Luis was far enough away from any tropical cyclone that it developed freely until reaching an extreme intensity of 150 miles per hour while approaching the Leeward Islands on September 4th. Very well-defined hurricane. The eye wall well-defined as well. And uh, the sun is shining in there, or was, and will be again tomorrow. But certainly around that, it is a very intense wind field. A compact storm, though. The winds, uh, hurricane force winds, extending out about 45 miles per hour, or 45 miles from the center. So it is a compact storm, a very tight, um, energetic storm. What can I say? A very dangerous storm is probably another expert to use here. We want to watch uh, the islands and of course later on the U.S. Virgin Islands and possibly Puerto Rico. You folks need to be on guard. Luis was long-lasting and remained a major hurricane of category 3 or higher during a full week including five days at category 4 intensity. That's quite a feat for any hurricane. Luis was also about size. The eye hurricane and tropical storm wind radii and overall cloud structure were all larger than normal. In fact, Luis had the characteristics of a rare breed of cyclones called annular hurricanes, which have large eyes, symmetric cloud envelopes, and little external banding. This explained the ability of the storm to remain very intense for so long. Preparations in Puerto Rico were hectic and chaotic. People freaked out as they heard messages such as it's gonna be worse than Hugo and nos va a partir, meaning it's gonna rip us through, and flooded lumber stores, grocery stores, and gas stations ahead of Luis's approach. I recall spending three hours in line at the Sam's Club in Caguas. It was not fun, but it was a memorable experience. This was the first hurricane threat that I could remember. I was four during Hugo and have bits of memory of during and after the storm, but not of the preparations ahead of it. I was 10 during Luis, so my memory retention was more developed and I can still glance through the entire experience with reasonable clarity. Early on September 5th, Category 4 Hurricane Luis hit the island of Barbuda, head-on with 130 mph per hour winds, while the southern eye wall moved over Antigua, where sustained winds of 120 mph gusting to 146 mph were measured. These are amazing observations for the southern eye wall of any hurricane moving westward, which is usually the weakest quadrant. Again, Luis had an extensive wind field in all quadrants. In fact, even Guadalupe, further south, registered sustained hurricane winds of 75 miles per hour, gusting to 83. Luis remained a category 4 of 130 miles per hour later in the same day of the 5th as its eye will hit the northern leeward islands of Anguilla, St. Martin, and St. Bart. The latter, which reported sustained winds of 124 miles per hour gusting to 155. The National Hurricane Center report also lists St. Kitts and Nevis, St. Eustatius, and part of the British Virgin Islands, most likely Anegada, as islands that experienced hurricane conditions as the storm blasted the region throughout the 5th of September. 
Luis was the worst hurricane to hit the Lesser Antilles since Hugo six years earlier, which was also a Category 4. During its Leeward Island battering, Luis slowed down and turned to the northwest, as the high pressure that steered it westward toward the Caribbean weakened due to a trough emerging from the east coast of the United States. This turn saved Puerto Rico and the U.S. Virgin Islands from feeling the full brunt of Luis, despite the initial expectations of a direct hit from this Category 4 monster. I woke up early on September 6 to find a Category 4 hurricane of 140 miles per hour that was already about 130 miles to my northeast and about 100 miles from the closest point in Puerto Rico, which in this case was the island of Culebra. But that was the center of the eye, and Luis was a huge storm. As a result, eastern Puerto Rico, Vieques, Culebra, and the U.S. Virgin Islands were deep within the field of tropical storm conditions. The winds in San Juan clocked to about 50 miles per hour sustained, with gusts of around 60 miles per hour. Higher winds were possible further east in Puerto Rico, in the mountains facing north and in the island of Culebra. From a Hurricane Geek perspective, Luis was my first big disappointment, but certainly not the last one. Please don't take it badly. As any common sense human being, I don't like nor root for the death and destruction that hurricanes cause. However, I understand that these are natural phenomena that just happened, and I try to get in their paths to experience their fury and splendor. Back to Luis, there was heavy beach erosion in the north coast and some tree, roof and sign damage due to Luis's passage near Puerto Rico. Electricity was gone in some areas and I don't have a full recollection whether we lost power at all at home. I remember seeing TV updates in the morning of September 6 as the storm was at its closest approach to us, but this could have been through a battery TV. As Luis moved away from us, it passed 200 miles west of Bermuda, but was so large that it caused tropical storm conditions there. Luis ended up causing trouble for ships at sea and even hit Newfoundland, Canada as a post-tropical cyclone of 120 miles per hour, which is an extreme intensity that far north. Next was Hurricane Marilyn, the one that became the storm of the year for part of Puerto Rico. Marilyn was different from Luis in many ways. Apart from having a female name, Marilyn developed closer to the islands and further south than Luis. It was also a smaller storm as it moved through the Lesser Antilles, and not as intense, at least officially. Marilyn became a tropical depression on September 12th, while east of Barbados, and intensified all the way to Category 1 hurricane intensity of 75 miles per hour as it passed just north of that island early on September 14. The environmental steering flow allowed for a northwesterly turn in the storm's track, which made landfall in Dominica in the afternoon of the same day on the 14th with 80 mile per hour winds. The National Hurricane Center forecast track had Maryland passing directly over Puerto Rico, so a hurricane watch was issued on September 14 at 11 a.m. and an eventual upgrade to a hurricane warning occurred that day at 5 in the afternoon. Puerto Rico and the rest of the Northeast Caribbean was bracing for another hurricane in just over a week. The next day on the 15th, we found ourselves preparing for Maryland's imminent impact as it was organizing over the Caribbean waters to the southeast of St. Croix in the U.S. Virgin Islands. That island was directly impacted by the storm in the early evening hours of September 15 with an estimated intensity of 100 to 105 miles per hour, or Category 2, but it's likely that the peak storm winds were already higher by then. The eye passed over eastern St. Croix, but the eastern eye will remain offshore. Despite this, 
and unofficial wind gusts of 127 miles per hour was reported there. As with Luis, I was frantically tracking Marilyn's approach to Puerto Rico. My nephew's dad, who is from Chile and never experienced a hurricane, was visiting during those days. I recall his nervousness and wary look during the night that the storm hit. The center of the eye passed about 50 miles to my east between midnight and 3 in the morning of September 16. Despite the very close approach to an intense hurricane, Maryland's tight hurricane wind field missed us. As with Luis, we got under sustained tropical storm force winds, likely gusting in the 60 to 70 mile per hour range. This wind gust knocked down a tall royal palm tree behind our house. The highest wind report in the main island of Puerto Rico was 41 miles per hour, with a gust of 58 miles per hour in Roosevelt Roads, which is a now closed naval base located in the easternmost tip of the island. The island of Vieques certainly got under hurricane conditions, where an unofficial ham radio report of sustained near 100 miles per hour was received, and Culebra got squarely inside the core of maximum winds as the northwest and western eye wall passed directly over the island. Unofficial reports of sustained winds of 101 miles per hour and a gust of 125 miles per hour came from Culebra. Winds at St. Thomas's Cyril King International Airport clocked at 104 miles per hour during a two minute period, which supports a slightly higher one minute intensity. Marilyn was a small storm in comparison to Hurricane Luis. Actually, Marilyn had such a small eye of less than 10 miles in diameter that it passed right between St. Thomas and Culebra without causing full calmness over any of those two islands. St. Thomas, however, got into the decrease of winds in the eye eye wall interface, meaning that the center of the eye passed closer to them. I couldn't verify if there was any decrease in winds near the eye on Culebra. It's possible that this may have happened, especially toward the eastern end of the island. Culebra and St. Thomas are about 30 miles apart. You can even see the rooftops of houses from the closest points of both islands, and Marilyn managed to squeeze right between them. Going over the intensity estimates for Hurricane Marilyn in the morning of September 16, just after passing Puerto Rico and thrashing Culebra and St. Thomas, the Hurricane Hunter aircraft reported 123 knot fly level winds in the eye wall of the storm. Using the standard 90% reduction factor to estimate surface winds, this would have supported a borderline category 3 to category 4 intensity of 125 to 130 miles per hour. However, the National Hurricane Center, in my view, was again going under the satellite and aircraft estimates and assigned an intensity of just 115 miles per hour by that time, which was the final peak intensity assigned for Hurricane Marilyn. Moreover, the night before, during the 16th of September, at 11 p.m., as Marilyn was blasting Culebra and St. Thomas, the Dvorak satellite intensity estimates from the Air Force and TSAF were 5.5 or about 117 miles per hour, and National Hurricane Center Dvorak estimates were even higher, at 5.9, right near 130 miles per hour, which is at the cost of Category 4 intensity. I hope that the Hurricane Reanalysis project eventually reviews this case and improves the best track intensity for Marilyn. If we blend the satellite estimates along with the aircraft and surface observations, Marilyn would still qualify for an intensity higher than the 110 miles per hour at the time it hit Culebra and St. Thomas. I believe the forecasters at the time gave too much weight to the Hurricane Hunter measurements, which were constrained by the presence of land during the crucial evening hours of September 15. This means that the aircraft must have not been able to sample the entire inner core, especially the northeast quadrant when it was passing over St. Thomas. I will argue that Marilyn was at least in the 120 to 125 mile per hour intensity range when its core nailed St. Thomas and Culebra, Puerto Rico. This without discarding the possibility of low category 4 intensity, given some of the satellite estimates, extreme damage, 
and the low pressure of 952 millibars for a small inner core which supported an exceptional pressure gradient in the eyewall. This is also consistent with the similarity in damage between Marilyn and Hugo, whereas Hugo was estimated at 125 to 140 miles per hour when it devastated the Virgin Islands, Vieques, Culebra, and eastern Puerto Rico. As with Luis, Marilyn's damage in the main island of Puerto Rico was relatively minimal. Again, minor wind damage occurred. Other effects included river flooding and heavy beach erosion. But Culebra and Vieques didn't fare as well. Culebra was nailed nearly as badly as it did during Category 4 Hurricane Hugo six years earlier. Over 250 houses were totally destroyed, with many more experiencing damage. Airplanes tossed like toys, and a defoliated landscape confirmed the intensity of the hit to this Puerto Rican municipality. St. Thomas was totally devastated as well, and it took years for the popular tourist destination to fully recover from this tiny but violent storm. Personally, the 1995 hurricane season and its duo of devastating Eastern Caribbean hurricanes shaped much of my passion for tracking and chasing tropical cyclones whenever and wherever possible. 